The Finley Holiday Slide Cassette Program that you're about to see and hear is the first of its kind ever made available to the public and is a new high in audiovisual entertainment for people of all ages. It is very simple to use. Please follow these instructions. First, place your slides in the projector and advance to slide number one. Then, each time that you hear the tone, advance the slide. It's as simple as that. So now, sit back and let's enjoy the show. St. Helens, a great majestic snow-capped mountain whose broad and lovely domain far below was forested with centuries-old fir and spruce. Dozens of breathtaking alpine lakes sparkled among the trees. One body of water, more beautiful than the rest, was appropriately named by the Indians Spirit Lake. Countless deer, bears, elk, and mountain lions roamed free throughout this pristine wilderness. In all America, there were few spots to surpass this place in beauty. All who saw it loved it. All who left it wished to return. And yet, amid this wonderland of nature, something was ominous and deadly. For Mount St. Helens was a sleeping volcano. The very word volcano stirs a thrill of fear in most of us. It conjures up images of molten rock blasted high into the air, Fingers of glowing lava surging relentlessly down mountain slopes. Fire, terror, and chaos. A hellish vision of utter destruction. And this is often all too accurate a picture. Mount St. Helens is a strata volcano that produces a Plinian eruption. The most dangerously explosive force in nature. It is composed of countless layers of ash, lava, and pumice. Accumulated over periods that are measured in thousands of years. Such a peak will normally have one major vent or conduit. When the volcano becomes active, hot magma from deep within the earth, over a hundred miles down, wells up within it. The magma is called lava when it's ejected out of the conduit. The distinguishing feature of volcanoes such as Mount St. Helens is the composition of the magma itself. It's not simply molten rock. The magma, while rising, becomes contaminated with crustal material increasing the silica content, and this causes the magma to become thick like taffy. Dangerous and volatile gases, including water vapor, are locked inside it. On a quiet Sunday morning, the beautiful mountain exploded with such awesome force that it destroyed itself and much of the surrounding countryside. Now let us tell you a story that sounds like a tale of a world gone mad one that will be retold again and again down through the ages, one we guarantee you will never forget. Although the story began thousands of years ago and will continue thousands of years into the future, ours will start on a quiet afternoon in early March of 1980. The radio, TV, and newspapers were filled with talk of inflation, the American hostages in Iran, and other world problems. The report of a 4.1 earthquake near Mount St. Helens in Washington State went almost unnoticed. That quake was followed by another on March 22nd and by a third the next day. By March 25th, temblers were shaking the mountain every few minutes. Seismologists, who were merely interested at first, now became alarmed. Then at 12.36 p.m. on March 26th, it happened. Mount St. Helens belched forth its first puff of life. The explosion rattled windows miles away. When the clouds cleared, there was a gaping hole 200 feet wide and 100 feet deep in the top of the mountain. And the clean, snowy summit was smudged with black volcanic ash. Soon, moderate earthquakes were shaking the peak six and seven times an hour. Smaller tumblers jiggled the area every minute. 
a major eruption seemed very likely indeed. But experts could not agree upon when it would come or how severe it would be. Their wildest imaginings could scarcely foresee the calamity that was about to befall the Pacific Northwest. Here, the mountain steams and puffs out occasional ash. Serene, frozen Spirit Lake is seen far below. Mount St. Helens had long been regarded as posing the greatest threat of volcanic activity in the Cascade Range. In 1978, two noted geologists had predicted that it would have a major eruption before the year 2000. It's the youngest, most active, and most explosive in the contiguous 48 states. This, the most temperamental of the Northwest peaks, has blown its top an average of once every century for the past 4,500 years. Its last known eruption was in 1842, but signs of earlier activity were visible everywhere on its slopes. For example, this is a large lava flow that surged down the southeast flank about 1400 A.D. On March 30th, a massive eruption threw a curtain of ash up to an altitude of 18,000 feet. Steam and ash pouring out under tremendous pressures blasted their way through the solid rock of the old dome. The crater grew larger and deeper with each successive explosion. As the eruption grew in frequency and intensity, the top of the peak was drastically altered. Muddy avalanches of rock, ash and ice swept down the slopes. Then, one morning, there were two craters instead of one. Side by side, like two ugly wounds, they blotted out the symmetry of that once beautiful cone. On April 3rd, the first harmonic tremors were detected. Deep under the peak, molten magna was moving upward. Eruptions now were much more powerful. Chunks of debris 12 feet in diameter were being hurled thousands of feet into the air. The pair of craters merged into one gigantic crater, one-third of a mile across. Fine gray ash showered down on Spokane, Portland, Vancouver, and Yakima. New vents appeared. The crater continued to grow. It reached the edge of the top and started chewing its way down the side. Then came the dreadful discovery. The north side of Mount St. Helens was bulging and the bulge was growing at the incredible rate of five feet per day. By April 3rd, it had swelled outward 320 feet, and it still continued to expand. The threat of a monster avalanche forced the scientists to move to safer ground. Harry Truman, proprietor of the lodge at Spirit Lake, refused to leave. Danger signs increased. Government officials set up new roadblocks and barriers around the mountain to keep out unauthorized people. But some sightseekers managed to sneak in for a close look by way of old logging roads. Then abruptly, the mountain fell strangely silent. The fateful morning of May 18th, 1980, dawned bright and beautiful. Crystal clear air, great pristine forests filled with birds and animals, scores of jewel-like lakes teeming with fish. It was a marvelous place to be and a great day to be alive. There was a strange stillness that morning. Even the birds were quiet. And in that stillness was an indefinable but haunting hint of doom. Towering high over its vast domain was the great mountain. No longer majestic, it was now grotesque, swollen, blackened and disfigured as if by a horrible disease. It was a giant about to die. On this very morning, quite by chance, an airplane carrying two geologists and their pilot was circling Mount St. Helens. The next three photos tell their dramatic story. At 8.31, a strong 5.1 earthquake struck the peak. They noted that debris was shaking loose. A minute later, another severe earthquake rocked the mountain to its core. Large avalanches began to roar down into the crater as shown in this exciting scene. At that moment, to their disbelief, a huge section of the peak's north face, including the fearful bulge, began to loosen and slide down the mountain. The men knew then exactly what was about to happen. The pilot, in sheer desperation, threw the plane into a sharp dive, and as they cleared the crater rim by one astounding second, it happened. In 
indescribably powerful pressures fed from the bowels of the earth had built up beneath the swollen mountain. Now, with that enormous weight gone, the fury under it at last was freed. At that instant, a preliminary plume of steam burst from the summit. Almost at once it turned into an engulfing nightmare of blackness, and the mountain exploded. This picture is one of the most astounding scenes ever captured on film. It caught the very instant of the initial explosion that was to become the greatest natural disaster in the history of the United States. In the areas north of the peak, scientists, reporters, and photographers were watching and waiting that morning. Many other people were in the area without authorization. At the instant of the blast, heads turned and cameras came into position. Only moments later, these people would be dead. One with his camera still held to his eye. Another sitting with his arms calmly folded across his chest. This is the way they were found, those that were found at all. So swift was the death that descended upon them. At 8.32 that morning, a hell was released on Earth. The devil within St. Helens broke free and tore the giant peak apart in one cataclysmic explosion. Its force was 500 times greater than that of the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. It roared down and over the foothills and into the lovely valleys, spreading out in the shape of a monster fan. In moments, it had blasted 156 square miles and annihilated everything in its path. Ash, hummus, and volcanic debris poured from the mountain in volumes equal to some of the most powerful eruptions of all times. The mountain was gutted. 1,300 feet of the north face had been pulverized and blown into the air. When the eruption began, U.S. Geological Survey scientist David Johnson was on a ridge northwest of the peak. At the moment of the initial explosion, he radioed, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. An instant later, he was engulfed by the volcano's indescribable fury. Temperatures in the roaring cloud of ash and gases that took his life may have approached 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A gigantic cloud roared into the stratosphere. High-flying aircraft later detected ash particles at 90,000 feet. As the billowing black cloud spread north and east, day was turned into night, calm into panic, order into chaos. Many terrified people thought the world was coming to an end. Even on the fringes of the main blast, people died where they stood. A few managed to survive by careening their cars down winding, rutted logging roads at 80 miles an hour, with the wave of destruction following close behind. Gigantic avalanches of mud, ice, and volcanic debris coursed down the mountain slopes, filling streams and rivers, destroying everything before them. Even the mighty Columbia River was clogged with massive amounts of debris. An entire section of the state of Washington was now reeling under the catastrophe. From deep within the earth poured forth hot gas and ash known as pyroclastic flows, roaring down her slopes at inconceivable speeds. They poured over the debris from the initial blast and the collapse of the north side of the mountain. The tremendous temperature of these flows transformed what was left of Spirit Lake into a superheated river of destruction that cascaded down the streams and rivers following the initial waves of destruction. This remarkable photograph is the first ever taken from an Earth satellite to catch the initial explosion of a volcanic eruption. Notice the donut-shaped ring in the upper left-hand corner. This is the shock wave, already 100 miles wide and expanding rapidly outwards. In the center of the donut, you can see the towering cloud of ash rising through the atmosphere. As the great eruption continued, the mountain spread her message far and wide. A disaster of enormous proportions was occurring, and nature had gone mad in a cataclysmic outburst without parallel in our world's modern society. The message was heard. Help was coming from the Air Force, National Guard, and Navy, from all government agencies, all available emergency supplies and personnel were being dispatched to Mount St. Helens. Dozens of rescue helicopters and ground crews headed into that hell, heedless of the risk. There are countless heroic stories of rescue. People were actually plucked from the paths of giant boiling mud flows with seconds to spare. A few souls were even pulled alive from ash so deep that helicopters could not land. 
Altogether, over 190 persons were rescued during the first hours after that initial blast. The continuing spectacle of destruction was watched in fascination by thousands of more distant onlookers. To witness a volcanic eruption is to see Mother Nature at her most exciting moment. At last, as the frightful hours passed and the day grew late, the shattered mountain began to quiet down. But the vast cloud of ash from the eruption had now filled the skies of six states. In this satellite view, we see the fearsome fall of ash as it appeared at 5 p.m. on May 18th, about eight and a half hours after the start of the eruption. Long before that time, a choking cloud was causing widespread consternation. The depth of ashfall ranged from a few inches in some cities to as much as eight inches in others. Throughout Washington, Idaho, and Montana, air traffic was at a standstill. Trains, buses, and trucks were halted. Thousands of people were stranded in strange places. Hundreds of millions of dollars of crops destroyed. Cities were paralyzed. By the time the ash fall ended, enough had been deposited to cover all of Long Island to the height of a 28-story skyscraper. Harry Truman was a legend long before that fateful day in May when his life was taken by the mountain he loved so dearly. This hearty 83-year-old man caught the attention of the whole country when, in salty terms, he refused to leave his picturesque lodge on the shores of Spirit Lake. As earthquakes racked his home and ash poured down, Harry simply went outdoors and talked with the Lord. He always believed he would die a violent and fiery death and he wished to be buried next to his beautiful lake near the heart of his beloved mountain. On May 18th, both his expectation and his wish came true. In the area around Mount St. Helens, the dawn of May 19th was cold and eerie. The dread and terror of the day before were heightened still further when people discovered the magnitude of the eruption. The scenes that morning that greeted the first airborne service men and geologists were overwhelming. One newsman described it as a view of Dante's Inferno. Countless columns of steam and ash rose from a devastated area that seemed to stretch to the horizon. Occasionally a giant vent spewed ash and steam high into the air. Once beautiful Spirit Lake had become a seething cauldron of rocks, mud, water, and millions of blackened trees. At one side, a gaping craterlet poured out huge clouds of ash. Where Harry Truman's lodge had been was now 40 feet of boiling mud. The landscape was pockmarked by giant craters where massive chunks of glacier and rock from the mountain were blown miles through the air and fell to earth. In many cases, huge pieces of ice were quickly buried by flows of hot ash. The resulting steam explosions lifted the ash high into the air in scores of smaller scale eruptions. As soon as it was possible, rescue helicopters landed near all vehicles that had been spotted within the zone of complete destruction, hoping to find survivors. There were none. The two occupants of this camper were among those killed. The force of the eruption was so great that a 10-ton caterpillar tractor, parked 10 miles from the peak, was blown 1,000 feet through the air. In some areas, trees and automobiles may actually have been vaporized by the blasts of searing gases. Parallel tragedies of the eruption were the enormous losses of trees and wildlife in this former forest wonderland. Millions of 200-year-old firs were flattened, their branches stripped, their bark torn off. In some cases, giant trees were ripped up by their roots and hurled across the ravaged landscape. One and a half million small mammals and birds perished, as well as thousands of deer, elk, bears, and mountain lions. The eruption has been described as America's greatest wildlife disaster. In this dismal scene, the remains of a small lake lie cradled in a valley of ruin. Altogether, 26 beautiful lakes simply vanished. The initial force of the explosion struck Spirit Lake. Millions of gallons of water were blasted into the lake's outlet. A vast wall of water was sent ripping into the Tootle River Valley below. 
Then a flood of hot ash, mud, and melting ice came roaring down the mountain slopes and poured into both forks of the Tootle River. The ash, at temperatures of 800 degree Fahrenheit, heated every stream, even the major rivers, the Cowlitz and the Columbia. Water temperatures rose to the point that millions of fish died. The wall of water and mud swept everything before it, smashing every bridge on the Tootle River. Farmlands were flooded, homes and factories destroyed. 100-ton logging trucks were picked up and tossed about like children's toys. The flow of mud and ash reached into the mighty Columbia itself. Within 18 hours of the eruption, the river's depth in places had shrunk from 40 feet to 18. One of the major shipping arteries of the country was paralyzed. On May 22nd, President Carter arrived in Portland to view the destruction in person. He found the devastation around the volcano unbelievable and said that even pictures of the moon's desolate surface had not prepared him for the awful spectacle. In this photo, we see the president meeting with the governors of Washington and Idaho. Total devastation stretches away to the south as far as ruined Mount St. Helens nearly 15 miles away. To the left is the debris-filled wreckage of Spirit Lake. The ridge in the foreground is 1,200 feet high and was heavily forested. A wall of water blown out of the nearby lake was pushed completely over this ridge. Here we have superimposed the original outline of Mount St. Helens over a photograph of the peak as it is now. Perhaps this comparison will convey the magnitude of the explosion that destroyed the mountain. Its elevation was originally 9,677 feet at the summit. The new crater is two miles long and one mile wide. Present elevation at the southern rim is 8,400 feet, and at the northern rim, an amazing 6,800 feet. This is nearly 3,000 feet lower than before the eruption. What was once a single mountain now looks as though someone had chopped away its entire center leaving a valley between two far lesser peaks. Mount St. Helens gave volcanologists from all over the world a unique opportunity. They were able to watch a volcanic dome being formed. In this view, the first dome has grown to the huge size of 1,000 feet across and 600 feet high. Note the hot gases and steam escaping from around it. The volcanic conduit, or vent, is located directly beneath. This first dome was blown away a few days later by a second huge eruption, which took place on July 22, 1980. The July 22 explosion once more hurled volcanic debris and ash 12 miles into the stratosphere. Pyroclastic flows raced down the north face and over the wasteland to the edge of what was Spirit Lake. Immediately after the July 1980 eruption, a new crater within a crater appeared. This spectacular view shows it at dusk, with the interior of the volcano covered in deep shadows. The dim light helps to accentuate the fiery opening from which so much destruction so recently poured forth upon the surrounding countryside. As we look with awe at one of the most remarkable photographs ever made, Perhaps we can see new meaning in the word volcano. The Mount St. Helens catastrophe caused over two billion dollars in damage. Seventy-five people are believed to have perished, although the exact loss can never be known. From this day forward, residents of the Northwest will have to live with the likelihood of another eruption, for Mount St. Helens most certainly will erupt again, because its history proves it to be active and very dangerous. But there is good here, too. We should remember that volcanoes are as much a part of nature as a storm or a sunny day. They are the safety valves in our violent and ever-changing Earth, helping to prevent even greater cataclysms. Nature herself and the wonderful planet we live on still hold glories and mysteries that we can scarcely dream of. Renewal around Mount St. Helens may already be underway. Because, for every occurrence, there is a purpose. In every end, there is a new beginning.